if you choose to buy and sell because it's easier, there's going to be a point where you won't be able to buy or sell anyway. So what are you going to do? Are you not going to buy or sell for the Lord or are you not going to buy and sell for Satan? So either one, you're going to not be able to buy or sell. You, you can see it right here. They do not buy their merchandise anymore. We're going to today be looking at Revelation 18 and trying to understand a little bit of what happens just after John on the island of Patmos was able to see the harlot woman sitting on the red beast. Now we talked about last time how that red beast was a new kind of thing in that there was a red dragon and then a beast that was not red and then now we have a red beast. So we've got these three different kind of seven-headed beasts or animals, if you will, in the book of Revelation. It's chapter 12, it's chapter 13, and then chapter 17. Well, now John sees something right after that where he's able to look and see that the glory of the Lord is described. If you have ever been interested to learn a little bit more behind the scenes of what's going on here, I encourage you to open up a book entitled Early Writings. And in the chapter toward the end called The Loud Cry, you will learn that angels are ascending and descending, but they're doing it in such a hurried manner. And it's as though there's some great event that's about to occur, where there's another angel that's commissioned to come down to the earth to fill the earth with his glory. And that's what we're picking up right here in chapter 18. After these things, which of course was the woman that was arrayed as a harlot with the on her forehead that she has daughters, I saw another angel okay so there was already a lot of commotion going on but there's a new paragraph here and a new i saw now just in case you don't know most of the time when john sees something when he looks and turns and he sees something or he says behold i saw or i beheld it's almost like a change of scenes in the book of revelation and many times it can be a change of time a change of place because like right now for example he's about to see something that's around the same time with this woman, but it's a new scene. And so when he sees this, he's actually understanding a little bit differently of what the ministers of heaven are doing compared to what was he, he was just seeing, which was the ministers on the earth, the ministers of evil, if you will, the woman and the beast and all the kings of the earth, etc. So when he sees something, it's like a new idea, a new focus, a new uh, understanding of what's going on. So now, going back to that section, I saw another angel come down from heaven. And so this angel is descending, just as we can see in the vision of Jacob in Genesis chapter 28, verses 11 through 13. He had a great power. Now, this great power, what is this great power? I'm going to go ahead and look and see that this is like the greatest, the highest, the largest, the loudest, the mightiest, the strongest Okay, he had great power, it says. Now, what is this word power? And we're going to say exousia, which is actually the competency, the ability to control, the delegated influence, the authority, jurisdiction, the power or right. He had basically almighty power. But this word is not almighty. It's just mighty power. See, he has been commissioned by God. And so, as a result of this angel being commissioned by God, he has God's power, okay? Now, this angel doesn't have almighty power because he's not the almighty, right? But he has the power of the almighty, which in here would be called the great power. And the earth was lightened with his glory. So, this word lightened simply means that it was made brilliant. It was illuminated, okay? Light was brought. And so, angels bring light. You see how that works? It helps people to see. And so this angel is making people to see. It's enlightening, illuminating, bringing to light, making people see. I think that's really important to understand that here this angel is actually coming down from God, commissioned with great power, and he is able to bring light to the subject. Now what subject? His glory, right? He's lightened with his glory. So his glory, God's glory, uh, being reflected by this angel is what is bringing light to the world. 
Don't forget that an angel was commissioned to do this. I'm just saying that the angels have great power and they have light to be able to show those that are in darkness. And he cried mightily with a strong voice. Now, remember, he doesn't cry almightily because there is no such word almightily, but he cries mightily because he has that delegated power. He cries mightily with a strong voice, kind of like the great power thing right here. He says, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. Now, wait a minute. Haven't we seen that before? We've like looked, you can see if you search for this phrase, it's only one time in the Bible that it's used, but you can go to Revelation 14 verse 8 and realize that Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city. And so there's, there's a play on words here. It's not exact, but it's pretty close. I mean, if you want to compare the two, you realize it's really the same thing. So this message that was first declared in the 1840s, 1843 specifically in 44, we have this message, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. This message of the second angel is actually repeated it's repeated over here toward the end of time after the woman of Revelation 17 with the harlot daughters and the red beast. All of those things after they've occurred. Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. And just as it says in the second angel, is become the habitation of devils, the hold of every foul spirit, and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Now, think about this for a minute. Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. There's two falls here. One um, certainly could be in the 1840s and then later a little bit beyond. And it's become, so it was not before, but it has become the habitation of devils. What is a devil? Well, a devil is an unclean angel. And so the unclean angels or the demons that are following Satan, they habitate the, that's their habitat. That's where they live. Okay, They cohabitate with those that are following the beast in his image, which of course would be those in Babylon. So the devils are habitating with the fallen Babylonian people, those that worship devils and the beast in his image. It's the hold or the cage of every foul spirit. Now, what is a foul spirit? Of course, foul would be something that was lewd, morally lewd, specifically unclean, or it says right here, demonic. Okay, so you have these demonic spirits. What would that be? Well, the same thing as the devils. The devils are foul spirits. The foul spirits are devils. And it's the cage, kind of like the hold, of every unclean, which is the same kind of concept as foul, and hateful bird. Now, a bird, what does a bird have? A bird has wings, right? Well, okay, so you're talking about devils, spirits, and birds. Well, the devils are angels, and angels are called spirits, like evil spirits, for example. You know what the Bible calls evil spirits angels, or angels evil spirits. But, you know, hateful bird, I think what's happening here is you're having the habitation of just different ways to describe the same thing. Evil angels, evil angels, evil angels, okay? So hateful birds, now think about this for a minute. An angel has wings, does it not? And so do birds, right? So birds fly, angels fly. And if you wanted to look in, for example, Ezekiel chapter one or 10, and 10, not just one or the other, you'd be able to see that these angels are actually, you know, flapping their wings. They have the ability to fly. And so these devil's spirits or foul spirits, unclean angels or hateful birds, I think it's all describing the same thing. Evil angels are surrounding those that are in Babylon. Now, why is that the case? Well, the plagues are about to fall here, okay? The plagues that we read about, we've already read about in chapter 16, they're about to fall because here Babylon is going to, or is becoming this how would you say like this uh, congregation of the devil's imps, the demons that are surrounding the, Satan's throne and worshiping and honoring him, they're all now coming together to bind around those that are following the beast in his image. Well, of course, the 
holy angels are not there. The holy angels are not devils. They're not foul spirits, or neither are they hateful birds. What you do have is you have holy angels, the angel being the word spirit, they are holy spirits. That doesn't mean they are God's holy spirit, but they are holy angels, and they are surrounding God's people that are actually wanting to follow the Father and his Son. So you have the beast in his image, and you have the Father in his image, okay? Or God in his image. You really have two that are surrounded with angels. You can see that these are habitating with evil angels, and these are going to be habitating with holy angels. My question is, which one do you want to be on? Which side, right? So here, Revelation 18 verses 1 and 2 really describes the holy angels coming down and the evil angels coming together as well. So you have like these two different groups. Haven't we heard about two different groups many times before in the book of, you know, Matthew or Mark, Luke and John? Well, sure. There's going to be the sheep and the goats. There's the wheat and the tares. There's the righteous and the unrighteous. There's those that follow the beast in his image and those that follow God in his image. You have these two groups. And what makes the difference? Well, one of them is surrounded with evil angels. One of them is surrounded with holy angels. Which group do you want to be in? And for me, I want to be in the group of the holy angels. I want to co-work with those that want to do God's will. I really want to do God's will. In my life, my words, my actions, my thoughts, plans, motives, everything. I want that to be wholesale on God's side. And if that's true, then I want to be working with the agents that he has sent. You see, because in this context, right before the plagues fall, you can read in Psalm 91, you know that famous psalm that everybody should have memorized? It's the one that says, A thousand shall fall at your left side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come nigh you. Why not? Because he has given his angels charge concerning you, that they will come and keep you in your way, lest you dash your foot against a stone. No, see, the angels are in charge of those that are on God's side during the time of the plagues. Well, at the same time, you have these here that are surrounded with demons. So you really have your choice, okay? Those that are spill, filled with the Holy Spirit and those that are filled with the evil spirit, okay? The evil spirit is in those that follow Satan. The Holy Spirit is in those that follow God. That doesn't mean there's disembodied spirits that somehow float around and fill people. No, it's a mental concept. If I'm willing to surrender my thoughts and my will to the Father, I have his holy mind, his Holy Spirit. If I would rather surrender my mind over to the enemy, I have his unholy spirit, right? So which one do you want to habitate your mind? The spirit of God and of holiness or the spirit of Satan and of evil? It's really about your mind. It's a war for the mind. And so that's what we're seeing here in Revelation chapter 18 verses 1 and 2. Let's continue. All nations, not just a few of them, not just Kenya, not Australia, not, you know, China or you know, all these other places, but all nations have drunk of the wine. Now, we know what wine does, right? It was something that Christ turned away from on the cross. He would not make his mind less capable of making good decisions. He was unwilling to drink the vinegar mixed with gall. He did not taste it. He was offered it twice, once before he was crucified, once after he was crucified. You can see that in Matthew 27. And he turned it away both times. Okay, so all nations have actually drunk. They partook of the wine. And it's the wine of wrath. Now, wrath is not a characteristic of God, right? Not something in a way that is just for the destruction without purpose. But we can see that there is the wrath of God that was sent to those that were contrary to his will in Revelation 16 for the purpose of judgment. Okay, so God does have this characteristic for judgment, but not the way that the world has it. The wine of the wrath of her fornication, which of course is contrary to the law of God, we can see that her wine is not the kind of wine that Christ was offering right before he was crucified to his disciples up in the upper room. But this is the wine of the wrath of of fornication. Now, what is this fornication? I think we've talked about this before, but the fornication is when the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. Who's her? She is the church. She is the church that controls the other churches of the world. That's the harlot daughters. And the kings and the churches come together. That's called fornication. That is a relationship that should not be in the eyes of God. 
Okay, Church and state should remain separated, especially here in a fallen world. Every single time church and state comes together in the Bible, you can see that it leads to persecution. Whether it be in type, when Joseph, as the holy remnant, and the woman who was wanting to commit fornication with this, you know, later to be king of the earth, she, Potiphar's wife, she wanted to commit fornication. And what did he do? As the way he should have, he turned and ran away from her. Well, jump down into another story that I'm just randomly choosing. Elijah has the same situation. There was an apostate king of the earth, which was actually Israel, but he was not God's people. But he was in God's church, right? So God's not people was there. And there was this idolatrous woman, Jezebel, and she's the one that had led him into the fornication, if you will, because they were having a relationship that they shouldn't have had. It was a church and state situation where she was, you know, in charge of Baal and all the false prophets, and he was supposed to be one of God's people, but they had joined together. It was fornication. So the church and the state were there, if you will. You have the Jews during the time of Christ when they said, we have no king but who? Caesar. Caesar was the leader of Rome. In fact, the Caesars were the ones that you bowed down to. You worshipped as your Lord and God. Okay, Caesar was the one who on the earth was representing God in the flesh. And so when the church said we have no king but Caesar, that was a huge problem. Because church and state came together again, but not only that, but under the false god of Caesar. Amazing, which would have been the false god of Rome which is kind of the same thing as what's happening today. That's what's going on with these women right here. They are drinking the wine of the wrath of her, Rome's, the papal Rome's fornication. Church and state combined under her God, which of course is, for the most part, the Trinity. Okay? It's a big deal. It really is a big deal. Going back to verse 3. All nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. The merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Now, who are these merchants? These people that are making money. It's not hard. You can go online and find for yourself the wealthiest companies or businesses in the world. What do you have? Well, you have oil companies and you have Walmart. You have Apple. You have Microsoft. You've got, you know, like Amazon and you, all these different car companies, GM. And you've got all sorts of companies. And of course, bigger than that are probably some of the pharmakia type companies of medicine and those types of things so what you have is the merchants of the earth now you're talking big business they are waxed rich well wait a minute what about those that are not merchants well they become very very poor so the merchants become very wealthy whereas there's a distinction between the rich and the poor and they become poorer and poorer as time continues and so the merchants are doing well because they're committing fornication with the kings of the earth and everybody's happy and everybody's excited. Well, I heard another voice from heaven. No, there, there was already the one angel that came, right? And he's the one that lighted the earth with his glory. But this is another voice saying, come out of her, my people. So it's a voice from heaven. Okay, same thing that happened with the father when he was in heaven. And there was a voice that came down that said to his son, this is my beloved son. And in that case, it was the spirit of God, the voice of God, the words of God. And here it's the same thing. The spirit of God, the voice of God, the words of God come down saying, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues. Now her sins will lead to plagues. So get away from her sins and you won't have the plagues because God will give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways, lest you dash your foot against a stone. There it is, Psalm 91. That's why you're not a partaker of the plagues, is because you've gotten away from sin. So frankly, repent. Turn away from those things you know to be wrong, and by the power of Christ, you will be blessed. Now this is why you need to turn away, because her sins, that which is contrary to the law of God, sin is not a nature, sin is a choice, her sins, her, her personal responsibility, her sins have reached unto heaven and God has remembered her iniquities. So God is remembering those things that she has done contrary to his will and God will recompense. Now, it's amazing because God is remembering her iniquities. Think about this for a minute. The Bible teaches in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, I believe it is, 
that by beholding we become changed. Okay? And maybe 17 and 18, I don't remember exactly what verse. But if we behold something, we become changed into its image or likeness. That's why God is a jealous God. In fact, that's exactly why. If you worship a brick or a piece of wood that's been painted as an idol, then you're going to become as smart as a brick or a piece of wood that's been painted as an idol. You see, God is jealous because we, he doesn't want us to be foolish or ignorant or idiots in any way. He wants us to be intelligent and people that are willing to surrender themselves to him intelligently so that he can use us as human intelligences to co-work with the heavenly intelligences, of course. So now, if God has taught us that by beholding we become changed, why doesn't he become changed as he remembers her iniquities? If he's beholding everything that's being done in this earth, getting record of every evil thing that has ever occurred since 6,000 years ago, why isn't he changed, right? That's a pretty profound thought to me. I just go into that in your own mind and, and throw it around a little bit and you, you realize like, wow, this is huge. God is unaffected by sin because there is no desire for it, even in the slightest bit. God doesn't want sin. He doesn't care for it. He chose to be righteous. He didn't choose to go the direction of evil. He knows how to do it. He didn't. He wants purity and holiness. And so I want to be like that. I want to be like him, right? So verse 6, reward her even as in the same way as she has rewarded you. Okay, so she needs a reward, but it's going to be even as she rewarded you. So if she gave you a dollar, she's going to get a dollar. And double unto her, double according to her works. Wait a minute. If she gives you a dollar, she's going to get two dollars? Oh, yes. So reward her as she rewarded you, but double unto her, double according to her works. In the cup which she has filled, fill to her double. I'm telling you, I don't want to worship the beast in his image. I don't want to follow Babylon. I don't want to be with this woman that is a harlot woman with daughters because they are going to get double what they have done. You think the uh, judgments of God are serious in Revelation chapter 14 verses 9 through 12? It's actually 9 through 11. Yes, those judgments are very serious. You will partake of the wine unmixed with mercy the wine of the wrath of God. So here, you're either going to have the wine of the wrath of God or the wine of the wrath of her fornication. There's only two options. Now, really, I'd rather partake of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, which is her anger against those that are righteous, compared to the wine of the wrath of his indignation, which is against those that are unrighteous. So you're either going to have the wine of the wrath of her fornication or the wine of the wrath of God. Your choice. Which one do you want? I want hers because hers is temporal against me representing God. I don't want God's wine because it's against those that are not following God and they're going to be destroyed. So really you're going to get one or the other. My choice is to have the one that's temporal. Okay. Now going over to here and also it's double. It's, it's going to be awful. The judgments of these people are going to be beyond our understanding. It says there in verse 7. How much she has glorified herself. Why did she glorify herself? Well, because she was unwilling to receive the glory that God would give her. So she had to have some glory. It was glorifying herself. She lived deliciously, okay? Obstentatiously. This is like the uh, luxuriously. This is the, word, the one who was unwilling to receive the gifts and beauty of God. And so she had to live that way herself. So much torment and sorrow give her. So how much she did this, glorified and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. So as she did it, give it to her the same amount. For she hath said in her heart, I'm not going to, I'm going to sit a queen. I'm no widow and I will see no sorrow. So she deceived herself and everybody else that followed her. That's why she's going to have to receive the judgments. Therefore, Shall her plagues come in one day? Now, I don't believe this day is prophetic. If it was, it would be 15 days, actually literal days. 
Now, why do I say that? Well, because if this is prophetic, you have to also take Revelation 14, verse 7 as prophetic, where the judgment of God, the hour of God's judgment had come. Well, what is it, only 15 days? Nope, it was since 1844, and it's been a long time. So it's not just 15 days. This one, I don't believe, is 15 days either. It's a short space, sure, compared to the 6,000 years that was done before. For example, the hour of God's judgment is a short space compared to the 6,000 years before. In this case, a, the, her plagues will come in a short space compared to the amount of time that she's been on the earth. So you can kind of see that it's more of a symbolic reference to a short time rather than a specific time frame. Because after 1844, the Bible says in Re Revelation chapter 10, time, prophetic time, not actual time, prophetic time will be no longer. And so in order to put this into prophetic time, you would just have to make a whole bunch of backflips and go through loops and stuff. And I'm just unwilling to do it. So it says there in verse 8, Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death, or a short time, death, mourning, and famine. And she shall be utterly burned with fire. We learned about that at the end of Revelation 17. Well, they were first eat her flesh and then burn her with fire. Kind of weird because you'd think they would do it otherwise. Like, you know, burn her and then eat her flesh. But they're going to eat her raw. And then they're going to burn her with fire. And of course, eating her would be like eating the lamb of God in the Passover, and then you burn the leftover with fire. So that's probably what they're talking about in Revelation 17. But for strong is the Lord God who judges her. Okay, so strong, there's that strength that the angel came with, is the Lord God. And the Lord God delegated that first angel with that strength and that mighty power. So here's a new paragraph. The kings of the earth who have committed fornication and live deliciously with her, so she's not only living deliciously on her own, the kings are living deliciously with her. They shall bewail her. They're going to lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning. Standing afar off, they're just like Peter. Remember on the day of the Passover, he was standing afar off. Standing afar off for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city, Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. Now, again, that one hour is, I think, a short space. You might think differently, but I think you're going to have to do a little bit of extra biblical conceptuality in order to do that. I just made up a word there. Verse 11. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buys her merchandise anymore. So the merchants, like Amazon and Walmart and Google and the oil companies and the richest families in the world, all these merchants of the earth shall weep. So merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buys their merchandise anymore. So that's it. Why? Why don't you buy their merchandise? You won't be able to buy or sell, friends. At the end of chapter 13, verse 17, if you don't worship the beast in his image, you won't be able to buy or sell. But now, if you choose to buy and sell because it's easier, there's going to be a point where you won't be able to buy or sell anyway. So what are you going to do? Are you not going to buy or sell for the Lord? Or are you not going to buy and sell for Satan? So either one, you're going to not be able to buy or sell. You, you can see it right here. They do not buy their merchandise anymore. Okay. So really, if you're going to accept the Lord, there's going to be a time where you don't buy or sell. But if you're going to accept Satan, there's going to be a time where you don't buy or sell. So really, it's up to you. Which one do you want to do? You want to serve the Lord and you want to watch him take care of you miraculously? Or do you want to protect yourself and later trust in Satan who's going to take away your stuff anyways? So really, it just makes good sense to follow the Lord. That's what I'm saying. So going to verse 12, the merchandise of gold, silver, precious stones, pearls, fine linen, purple, uh, silk, scarlet, thion wood, all manner of vessels of ivory, most precious wood, brass, iron, and marble, cinnamon, odors, ointments, frankincense, wine, oil, flour, fine flour, wheat, beasts, sheep, horses, chariots, slaves, and souls of men. All these things are what they were purchasing. It was merchandise. Now, the sanctuary is made of gold, silver, precious stones, pearls, fine linen, purple, silk, scarlet, fine wood, all, well, more like uh, acacia wood or um, shatim wood. The vessels of I don't remember ivory there, but um, precious wood, yes. Brass, yep. I don't know about iron, but maybe marble. 
but certainly the different cinnamons and odors, ointments, frankincense, wine, oil, flour, wheat, beasts, sheep, horses. I don't know about horses, but um, let's see. So they had a few extra things in there, but most of what they were selling is what God offered in his sanctuary service, okay? One of the things that's awful is the souls of men. They are literally selling, they are making merchandise of the souls of men. That is something that they will have to double receive their punishment for. The fruits that thy soul lusted after are departed from thee. So you know how you don't have the same kind of uh, pleasures that you used to have. And all things which were dainty and goodly are departed from thee. And thou shalt find them no more at all. So that's it. No more. There's a point, friends, where those that follow the beast in his image will have no more fruits, dainty things, goodly things. It's going to be gone. The merchants of the earth, remember those big merchants, of these things which were made rich by her, they shall stand, just like Peter, afar off from the fear of her torment, weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, that great city. By the way, there's only three cities that are called that great city in the Bible. It's Nineveh, it's Babylon, it is Jerusalem. Okay, That great city that was clothed in fine linen, in this case it's Babylon, and purple, just like the priests, scarlet, just like the priests, decked with gold, just like the priests, and precious stones and pearls, just like the priests. One of the colors that they don't have is right here. See this? This right here is blue. Okay, They don't have blue. And so it's really interesting how they have all the similar colors, but they don't have blue. Why? Because Numbers 15 toward the end describes why they don't have blue. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and bid them that they make them fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations, and that they put upon the fringe of the borders a ribbon of blue. Okay, so they needed borders, fringes in the borders of their garments, and those fringes needed to be blue. And it shall be unto you as a fringe, that you may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them. So that's why, okay? It's for a fringe that... You may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them so that you seek not after your own heart and your own eyes after which you used to go like the woman of Revelation 17, a whoring, that you may remember to do all my commandments and be holy unto your God. Okay, so 1537 and onward is where you're going to be able to see why they don't have the blue is because they don't and will not keep the commandments of God. But they want to look like they're doing everything right. So they've got the red, they've got the purple, they've got the gold, they've got the jewels, they've got all sorts of stuff that makes them look like the priests of the sanctuary, but they don't have the blue. So it's like, nobody say anything to anybody. We don't have any blue. Just, you know, keep going on like normal and everybody will be deceived. And it's true. Everybody is dece- Almost everybody is deceived. And so it's really a big deal that she's not wearing blue because she is unwilling to be surrendering her life to God's will. She just wants all of God's stuff. It's kind of like Satan, right? Satan wanted all the stuff, but he didn't really want to be doing God's will. So it's very similar. Satan is being um, exposed through this power which is a woman that has daughters, okay? For in one hour, so in other words, a short time, a so great riches is come to naught, and every shipmaster and all the company of ships and sailors, that's the way that they send the merchandise from one place to another, and many, so like Amazon, you know, this is like Amazon. And as many as trade by sea, they stood afar off and cried with, when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? Interestingly, because they do the same thing in Revelation 13 when they're asking the question, what beast is as strong as this beast? In fact, I want to find it real quick because I don't remember which one it is. Who is like unto the beast, it says in verse 4, who is able to make war with him? So who is like unto the beast? That's a good question because you could ask, remember this beast was personating Jesus Christ? Who is like unto God? right? And that's the, the name for Michael. Uh, that's what Michael means. 
And so it's the same thing. What city is like unto this great city? It's kind of the same thought as it was back there in the beast of Revelation 13. And they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness, because in such a short time she is made desolate. Now, remember Christ left his church during the time he was on the earth, and this church has been left by Christ as well. That church does not have Christ in it. In fact, that church could be like the Laodicean church, where, remember, Laodicea has a picture of Christ outside of the church, knocking on the door, trying to get in. In other words, that church is desolate of his presence. He wants to come in, but he's, he's not in there, and so that church is desolate. And frankly, we know that that church can apply to a lot of denominations today, specifically in the writings of Sister White, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. That is huge. Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. So we're not to bewail this situation if we are partakers of holiness, if we are wanting to build our foundation upon the apostles and prophets, we are to rejoice, not lament, because God has avenged you on her. And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone, cast it into the sea, saying, so in other words, this angel took up, very important, he lifted it up, a stone like a great millstone, and then he threw it down, okay? Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. And that's, remember that last time I looked up the uh, 16 different points that show like Babylon was this way and, and uh, the New Jerusalem's this way. And you see those 16 points. Well, the holy city comes down from God out of heaven. Well, in this case, a mighty angel was commissioned by God to take up that millstone and throw it down. So this millstone came down from God out of heaven, if you will. And it's very similar to what happened with New Jerusalem this Babylonian system will be thrown down. And then you have here that they will not be found anymore at all in you. So the voice of harpers, uh, remember the 144,000 are harping with their harps? You can read that in Revelation 14, the first verses. Well here, the voice of harpers, musicians, we know that angels are the ones that sing, the pipers and trumpeters, they'll she be heard no more at all in you. So you're not going to have the the rejoicing, the singing, the um, entertainment like you used to. No craftsman like uh, Bezalel in the sanctuary of whatsoever craft he be shall be found any more in thee, and the sound of a millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee. So the millstone we know is, is for the purpose of, uh, you know, making olive oil or crushing grains and different things like that. The millstone won't be heard. This is going to be a desolate area. The light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee. And the light of a candle, of course, was like the ten virgins, for example. They each had a candle. But that light's not going to shine anymore on them. Nope. And the voice of the bridegroom, which we know is Christ, and the voice of the bride, which is his, his church, shall not be heard anymore at all in thee. It's desolate. You're, you're not going to hear the voice of the bridegroom anymore. Christ is gone. He, you have committed the unpardonable sin. He doesn't dwell with you anymore. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth. For by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. Now this word sorceries is really interesting. It's only used, for example, it's only used um, three different times in the Bible. In Galatians, it's witchcraft. In Revelation 9, it's sorceries. And in Revelation 18, it's sorceries. But what is this word? If you triple-click this word in this program... It is pharmakia, okay, which is from whence we get medication or pharmacy. So wait a minute. By your pharmacy were all nations deceived? Like the vaccines? Is that what I'm reading? Like the, you know, the crisis and the playing of this idea that, you know, everything, everybody's going to die right away and so everybody must get some kind of well, no, it's not true, but yes, people have been deceived. All nations have been deceived by that pharmakia, in fact. 
And we can see all nations coming together, kind of like the Ten Kings of the end of Revelation 17, because of these sorceries, the witchcraft, the pharmakia. And in her was found the blood of prophets, of saints, and of all that were slain upon the earth. And so she is a murderer. She is a deceiver. She uses pharmakia as one of the tools in her hand, but she will be desolate. She has wrath, but so does God. You're going to either partake of her wrath or God's. She has commandments, and so does God. She has a day to honor, so does God. She has a city, a temple, a wilderness, a woman, all this stuff. So does God. And so really, which one do you want? It's up to us. We can choose whether to be, part of, be in this world but not part of it, or we can be part of this world and be destroyed with it. So it's, it's up to us. God has given us the ability to think and to pray and to turn away from our sins so that we are not partakers of her plagues. And if we're willing to do this, if he's given us the courage and the skill to think this through, then please, by God's grace, continue on that path. May the Lord bring us all, every one of us, into a very positive, powerful, direct toward heaven walk in our experience so that others will be influenced and they can come with us. That's my prayer, and I'm going to ask God to bless us as we all kneel together, surrendering our lives to him, asking for his blessings in our experience. Let's, let's pray. Our Father, I ask that you'd please continue to lead us. Give us wisdom and direction. Help us to know what it is that you're saying to your people. And I pray that we would be able to understand so much more in your word than we do so that we can have our lives transformed into your likeness, not into the likeness of those that are on this earth that are committing fornication with the woman and her daughters, but rather into the likeness of your holy apostles and prophets. We thank you for this, asking that you bless and give us courage, give us direction, give us skill and wisdom in all that we do, that we can bring glory to your name. Thank you for this and keep us from this world, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.